Hello there and welcome to my Arty Corner here on YouTube. My name's Angela, Angela Porter and I'm an artist best known for my grown-up colouring books um, for the Creative Haven series, Colour Me, Colour Me Calm series with Lacey McClough and many others as well. Um, my YouTube channel isn't about colouring books per se but it's more about drawing because drawing is what I love to do and um, particularly whimsical, stylized, full of pattern, quite intricate. That's my kind of thing. And I'm also dabbling with hand lettering, but today I'm having a break from hand lettering, sort of. No lettering from me, but I'm using some, a quote as part. But before I start that, say anything about that, can I say thank you for all who've subscribed, given thumbs up, um, shared videos, shout outs to me, shared your work with me so I can see what you've done with perhaps some inspiration you found in what I'm doing. And for all the lovely comments as well, a huge thank you. If you haven't subscribed, please do. It's completely free and it helps me, the channel, hugely. But also, if you click the notification button, you get a little notification when I upload a, another video, which is many days in the week but it can be a bit sporadic at times, depending on what else is going on in life. So um, with no further ado, you can see what's in front. I'm sure you've read the quote. It's one I stumbled across just a couple of days ago and I was thinking about what to do today because I know that, you know, sort of like doing letters and filling them with pattern and things like that is interesting to some to not to everybody. And sometimes I need a bit of a break as well. And, um, change things up, keep things interesting, but that's part of who I am anyway as an artist. I, I like to do different things. I don't like to be stuck with just one kind of thing. But I do always tend to cycle back to these intricate, more abstract and stylized kinds of drawings. It seems to be what I like to do. I'm whimsy. I like some whimsy. But this is a lovely one from Tim Burton and it struck some memories off in me, which I might share with you as I draw. So anybody with artistic ambitions is always trying to reconnect with the way they saw things as a child. And I think it's lovely and it frees us up so much in some ways from artistry. And if you know Tim Burton's um, illustrations, um, the drawings he did for Like a Nightmare Before Christmas and other things, they are that kind of adult um, sort of whimsy and cartoony or illustrative kind of way but it also appeals to children very much. It, I'm not explaining myself well but I, I do love what he does, um, I have to say that. Anyway, so I printed this out, I popped the, the quote into um, my Affinity publisher, my desktop publisher, printed it out. I had trouble getting it to print because I wanted to print it on a different mixed media paper, but it just wouldn't have it. So this is Claire Fontaine um, Paint On mixed media paper, which has um, a fair, it's got some tooth and texture to it, but it's very white. And it means that if I decide to add colour, I can. And I've just realised, but the only thing I can't really use with this are alcohol markers because it just soaks them up like a sponge so that's not a good thing but um, pens and so on I'm prepared to sacrifice the nibs of fine liners for this so I've already said sorry to them but it does tend to wear on them um, this was A4 paper A4 is about letter size but I actually measured around the edges and um, worked out how to create something that most probably is squarish. No, it's not, because this isn't a square, but it's the same, sort of like the seven centimeters all the way round. For some reason, I've just realized that was a really silly thing to do, but it's okay, I'm going to go with it. So I've got a lovely box here, um, and I did put the, the double lines in for myself rather than me trying to draw it by hand, because I have a feeling today we might have trouble with this. And um, I can do all kinds of things here, and I'm going to start at the top with some, I think mushrooms are in order here, to be honest with you. And um, I 
and have so, you know all kinds of things. I'm not going to try and you know create this as if it's a garden with trailing things and so on. So I might actually add mushrooms that are growing from the bottom because they can be very strange things the way they grow, can't they? So let me put a little border inside there and I'm going to match that on the top here. But I am actually going to have a stripy mushroom. And I may come back and add black and white stripes to this because I do love black and white stripes. This is an O3 um, Unipin pen, you know, the equivalent of an O3 um, Sakura Micron or similar. There's lots of these kinds of pens out there. These it's either microns or these are the ones I tend to go for. Um, these often because they, they they're a little cheaper than the, the microns. And I am going to use variation in line thickness to suggest you know volume and shadow just a little bit because I can. It's gonna be lots of paper turning, I'm sorry to say today, most probably. And I am going to pop some shadow in the stem with just some dots. Stippling is the correct term. And using the density of dots to suggest where there's more shadow than elsewhere. I've said I'm not sure what I'm going to do with this. So I think I will just add some. suggestion of shadow to this side with fairly long lines but on the other side perhaps slightly shorter just enough there so I'm going to end up with something that's a bit like an etching or a woodcut I think today and I will I, I may possibly even add start to add some color to be honest because I think this is one that will benefit from some colour. Well, you can't have one mushroom on its own. So let's have another one here. It's growing in a strange way behind this one, perhaps. And now I've got this shape that I'm looking for here or the way, not the shape necessarily, but the way I've added shadow, um, texture shading, um, groping around for the words, then I don't need to do it all as I go along. I've got this one at the start as my reference for all the others, which could turn out to be fairly interesting is what I'm going to say on that one. But I will... Just add the gills in there, underneath. Add some stippling in there. And I think I might, because where they overlap here, I'm going to get more shadow where there's the overlap than the rest, I think, possibly. So, What I haven't done is thicken the lines yet to add that extra darkness of line. So on this side it is really, it's just little short lines just to add that density of ink. So this quote this morning just gave me some memories. As my older sister is a good artist um, and... You know, I was born in the 1960s and she's 10 years older than me. And I can remember a drawing that she did that used to live in my, used to live, used to hang in my parents' house. And it was kind of, I suppose, kind of like the ones that I do where I've, you know, I sort of start at the bottom and everything sort of like becomes all entangled up and higgledy-piggledy and, um, you know, 
that crazy kind of entangled kind of doodle worlds that I do. And of course, this kind of weird, I say weird, it's not really weird, but, um, you know, sort of like psychedelic art almost. But she'd done this drawing in black and white, you know, pen on white paper, black pen on white paper. And this quote just took me back to that because it was, it always seemed to be there. This, this particular drawing. Now, whether that was just because, you know, it was, uh, let me try, try and find my words. It always seemed to be in the house because I was 10 years younger. So she'd have been drawing this when she was a teenager and um, for whatever reason it got framed and hung in my in the family home and it was always always a kind of influence on me and you know this this quote reminded me of that because it was something that fascinated me as a child and a young adult though I'd never really tried to copy or emulate her work but it obviously has its influence on me in some way or another which is fine it's it's what it is, it's what happens. So it took me back to that. And then, you know, as I'm talking, there are memories of me having art lessons when I was 11, 12. And the art teacher I had was, was fantastic. She was, um, I would actually it would have been 12. Um, and just sort of like wasn't quite as didactic as other art teachers would have was experimental she was much younger much more um, bohemian than other art the other art teachers that I remember in school were very staid and very dull and ordinary but I, I don't remember exactly what we did but I do remember that we had um You're all the way through school, even as a teacher, every year there'd be a Nystedvard around St. David's Day. A Nystedvard is um, it's a Welsh celebration of arts and creativity and all, all kinds of things. In schools you even get, you know, sporting competitions and cooking and art and making things. You know, I can remember entering um, things that had been sewn or knitted. She were encouraged to take part in the off-stage activities as much as the on-stage, because not everybody's a performer. And um, your recitations and writing and all sorts. And art was one of the competitions, you know. Embodied creativity as much as anything else. And um, that year, you sort of like you had a list of topics you could choose from for your art entry. And one of them was skyscrapers. And in my head, I had this vision of tall buildings floating in the sky on clouds. You know, I'm not the only one who would have had that vi vision or image in their head, I'm sure. But I thought, oh, I'll go with that. So somehow I'd got a set of coloured Indian inks at home. And um, I think they might have been a present at some time. And so I can remember using these, and the Indian inks were all really vibrantly coloured. They were Wins the Windsor and Newton ones, which you can still get. So I had this huge sheet of paper that we were given for our artwork, art entry, and I created this image of skyscrapers. And surprisingly, I actually... I don't think I won, but I had a place, and it's the only time... I'd ever won anything or, you know, gained, you know, sort of like a place, you know, in the top three, any any competition in school that I'd ever entered, which was, you know, amazing. And then the following year, moved, didn't move schools, I was still in the same school, but our school was on two different sites. So those 
at the high school. So those in, um, in the two years where you were 11 and 12 um, were on one site and then um, from 12 to 18, well, 13 to 18, that's right, because you'd be 13 in the second year, 12 to 13, um, was on a completely different site. And so when I moved there, the art lessons continued. It was in our year when we were 13, we did an awful lot of subjects. And then it, towards the end of that year, you'd choose five subjects to do um, alongside English and maths for your O-levels, or at the time there were CSEs. And... Uh, the art teacher I had, or the curriculum that year, I seem to remember drawing my hand in pencil for the whole year. That's all we did. That's all I seem to remember doing. And I found it dull and tedious, and you couldn't deviate or use any other material. That's all you did, week in, week out. And at the end of it, you know, when you're coming to choose the subjects to study for your, well, then it was O-levels, my art teacher said to me, don't even think of taking art as an option, not even as a CSE O-levels were the higher level of exams. CSEs were a lower level. Don't, not even for CSE. Not even just to fill in time. You will not be accepted because you have no talent whatsoever. And uh, that just echoed what everybody was telling me in my family home. That I was no good and everybody was better than I which was pretty standard actually growing up on everything. Um, and uh, so I didn't take art and I spent the next 30 or so years of my life believing that apart from scientific drawings, which I was all right at, though I used to get criticised for being too fussy and... Um, trying to draw things to, well, not realistically, but I insisted on using colour and using flowery language for colour, being very precise about colour and so on. Um, not quite what is expected when you're doing scientific illustrations or drawing what you can see down a microscope or a close observation of a flower. Um, but that was me. And some, some lecturers were quite forgiving, others weren't. Some said, Angela, <laughs> I know, but I can't help it. And they go, you know, it's okay. We know what you mean. I said, yeah, well, it is blue, but it's not a dark blue. It's not a light blue. It's somewhere in between and it reminds me of this colour. So I used to, some were quite forgiving like that. But my um, illustrations were always much looked forward to when I did them by them. So, moving forward, throughout my teaching career, because after I did my degree and then my PhD in science, I went on to train as a science teacher. I'd have to teach my, my pupils, my students, how to make, how to draw things, you know, in a scientific manner, which is very stylized, very um, simplified very stylized. you're looking for features, for shapes, and um, not trying to add too much detail, but try to get just enough that somebody can recognize it. If they looked in the microscope, for example, they would know what they were looking at. And um, they would, um, you know, this is what we were aiming for. If it was scientific apparatus, it would be how you put the apparatus together so that somebody else could do it in the same way you did, did the experiment and, and, you know, all things like that. 
as well as, you know, diagrams for posters and, and what have you, you know, any work that we did like that. And I had great love of creating posters and displays for my, um, for my, my the walls inside and outside my laboratory at school, you know, my teaching laboratory. Because what you could purchase never seemed to fit the bill quite. Some did, but not others. And I liked nice bright colours and vibrant and lively and interesting displays. And so I wanted to make sure that my room was like that, that it was an interesting place full of things to not just share knowledge, but to question and to get people to think about things, as in my students. And I also had um, a very good friend, still do, I haven't seen her for a long while because she's still teaching and I'm not, but she's retiring this year, so hopefully we'll have a chance to catch up. And the staff whom we went to was a very irreverent kind of staff room where there was a lot of humour um, poked at um, various people because they things they did and said were genuinely ridiculous and frustrating and annoying all at the same time. But we, you know, some sometimes the way you deal with all of these things is is humour. And I started to draw sort of cartoon, cartoons, little stories with these characters in, with all the silly things. And my friend, was sort of like my partner in crime in this, we'd sort of sit together and absolutely laugh like drains as stories or even sometimes songs would develop. Um, and it was all put into cartoon and picture form. And... It was more it was also poking fun at all of us as well, so it wasn't just one way. It was um funny, and I did it just for fun and for that kind of pressure release that you did, but I didn't think there was anything particularly good or wonderful in them. They were very stylized, very cartoony, not very what what was considered artistic, what I'd been told was artistic. What you're brought up believing is artistic in terms of, um, you know, it has to look lifelike. It has to be very realistic. It has to be like a photograph. Um, and then just, you know, that carried on for quite a while until we had a new head who was lovely. And suddenly there wasn't so much stuff to have a go at. And this all kind of fizzled out and stopped. Um, but I was still drawing as part of my teaching. You know, my special needs pupils would often say to me, Miss, Miss, can you show me how to draw a duck? So I'd have to simplify a duck and draw it. And um, so we had whimsical animals or whimsical boats and things like that. And it was... I found that quite easy to do and fun to do and they certainly did enjoy it. And um, I really, you know, it, there, there were always these little creative outlets for me. But then, you know, I'd try drawing at home for fun. Um, I had a copy of Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain by, I oh, can't remember her name, but it's a kind of classic book that shows you that if you think you're not, if you don't think you're an artist, then it's all to do with the way you look at things and um, draw things. And by doing exercises that trick you into using the right side of your brain, which is your artistic side, then you can truly become an artist or, you know, learn to draw things in a different way. Things like focusing on the negative space rather than drawing an object. Um, 
if you're drawing from a photograph, turn it upside down. It fools your brain into looking for shapes and patterns in one way or another. And you find that it's a lot more successful to draw things. It's a book I can heartily recommend. I've still got a copy of it here somewhere. Um, Betty Edwards, I think it was by. Drawing on the right side of the brain. And so I was drawing that, but, you know, whatever I drew was poo-pooed by the long-ago ex and other people as not being good enough. Just re repeating what happened to me in childhood, and I never thought anything of it. But then, heading towards my 40th birthday, my life had changed. I'd left the long-ago ex. I was meeting new people and, of you know, sort of like life just changed for the better mostly, even though I was beginning to struggle with more with my mental and emotional health, but I didn't realise that because it just seemed to be more of the same that I'd always had through my life. And um, the head of art at the time... started art classes for staff after school for stress relief, relaxation, for fun. Just come along, do some art, enjoy yourself, relax at the end of the day, you know, once a week. Well, that turned into me doing um, some exams in art with the older students in the school studying um, a levels. So A levels are taken usually by students who are aged 18 or in the year they turn 18 and the qualifications that are needed for entry to universities to study degrees. So the education system in the UK is a bit different to say America and um, so I, did, I, I had my arm twisted. A very good friend of mine told me I'd better do it or else. And suddenly I was doing all of this art that was observational, so it satisfied my scientific curiosity, my scientific need. But I was also experimenting with all kinds of things, from pottery to um, etchings and printings and collagraphs and different kinds of dry media, watercolour. I did work with acrylics and oil paints, and I really don't like acrylics and oil paints at all. They're too slimy. Um, and just trying lots of things out and sketchbooks and all kinds of things. I went to do life drawing classes, after, you know, later in the, you know, in the evening once a week in a local art centre. And I suddenly discovered that I could do art or oh, textile work as well just loved doing my textile work based on drawings that I'd done and observations I'd made and you know it's all the abstract and um, work that I love now is taking small pieces of things and you know blowing them up big you know I've got a drawing on the wall in my bathroom of a trilobite fossil which was about two three inches long and this drawing is about I don't know three feet in height when I took it in to show the art art teachers, um, one of them said, and where do these live? I stole. They, they're found all, all over the world. Where do they live? Uh, in Britain? Yeah, yeah, you can find them in Britain. And then the penny dropped. She meant, are they still alive? Uh, do they grow this big? And I said, no, they, they, they were extinct millions of years ago. <laughs> Because I just love trilobites, so um, amongst other things. So that set me on my journey to what I do now and the patterns and so on. I fell in, at the same time. I fell in love with Romanesque architecture and Gothic architecture, and that's where all the arches and the um, particularly from Romanesque architecture, all the geometric patterns started coming out, and others and the textures I'd look at. And so it's been a journey, but drawing with pen or pencil 
on paper was always my favourite thing to do and making those observational drawings still. But it was always simplifying them as well as I look back. Um, you know, I can draw things that look like, not photographic, but, of you know, light and shadow. I like to, always like to draw with uh, a mid-toned paper and then use white and a lighter colour and a darker colour to get the shadows and the highlights in, the tones in. But, um, you know, pen and paper just works just fably. And being able to put these little textures in and so on just, just helps um, a great amount. Um, so, but then I always had a love of such things as a child when I look back. I'd get lost in patterns of, um, in hieroglyphs and decorations from ancient Egypt or anything that I saw that was full of pattern would fascinate me. Tiled floors and, you know, um, even then. So even though I didn't realise it at the time, my, my head was getting filled up with, filled up, filled up with things I loved anyway. And sort of like this quote today made me think of all of those things. And so I've been chatting while I'm drawing. I haven't done so much drawing, but I think you can see what I've done. I mean, it's Tim Burton quote, so you're going to get Tim Burtonish, you know, tentacles and spirals coming out of here but there'll also be a lot of stuff that is me as well is that um, I just love things like this and I just can't help but do stuff here so you can't have tentacles without at least one skull A friend of mine calls these drunken party skulls. I often put party hats on them because that makes me smile. But drunken because they're sort of like falling all over the place as well. So I'm going to give them eyes that go in weird directions as if they are a bit stunned and drunk. Because, you know, what else can a girl do? So, regardless of what you may have been told, because if your art lessons when you were younger were similar to mine where you were most most teachers expected things to be almost like photorealistic and everything in the right place and as much detail as you could. Um, and that if you were somebody with a, an imagination, it was frowned upon to express it artistically or sense of humour. Then I had to unlearn a lot of what I'd been told about myself, not just artistically, but in other ways as well, but I'm talking about art here. And although I'm still, you know, I cycle around lots of different things, looking at, you know, ways of creating and trying new things out, I always seem to circle back towards this kind of stuff, especially when I've, I've overextended myself in terms of my boundaries or my limits with art. Perhaps I've, you know, been experimenting and I've gone a bit too far outside my little comfort zone. Now that skull is sort of like floating midair. No, I'll leave it floating midair because it can happily do that. So I'm just adding some shadows there. Um, I'm not going to try and add any inside the eyes. But uh, I am going to add some stippling. I think to the left and towards the bottom of the skull and where there is overlap just to help with some sense of volume but 
but it's, you know. I'm not dismissing artists who are able and want to draw in very realistic to, you know, realistic ways. And that is entirely their, their mode of expression. That is what they enjoy doing or the skills they've developed to allow them to do this. And I admire their skill and their tenacity for such things and their abilities. But it's not the only kind of art. And when we look at the old masters, as they're called, and how, you know, they represented, you know, if you think about the ones with Elizabethan folds and every little fold and lace, a bit of lace was painted on there so realistically. I sometimes think, well, you know, those were the kind of the photographers of their day, you know, with portraiture and so on. And it was when the pe people came along and did more um, artwork with more feeling in or impressions in. Think about some of Turner's works and then the Impressionists. And there were others as well. You know, I've got a particular fondness for like William Blake. And then you have the arts and crafts movement where everything is quite stylized and so on but it's not the only time then you can see there are so many different ways of working and everybody has a different way of expressing themselves and what makes them you know um i suppose happy motivated or you know um i'm not quite sure authentic true to themselves and there's no harm in that at all, because the world would be very boring, wouldn't it, if we ever, everything was the same, we were all the same. And I think making people smile and laugh, or at least smile, is what I'd like my art to do. You know, for humour, I need somebody to kind of um, play with in terms of humour to bounce ideas off or, you know, to get all those funny things we say or sometimes and something will click in my head and I'll want to draw it. The sad thing is that I really do have to write that down almost straight away, otherwise I forget it. But... tentacles get fatter towards the end well in my world they can um, perhaps it's moving a bit towards me so well quite a bit towards me actually to look that much thicker but that's fine it is what it is as I'm drawing directly in ink I can't correct what I've done so I have to work with it and um In this case, ink isn't always that forgiving, is it? But it's fine. So, if you're still harbouring some of these thoughts about art, and what art should be, or what makes a good artist or good artwork, then... It may be time to let go of some of them and not judge yourself too harshly anymore and to express yourself in the way that makes sense to you, that's authentic to you, that is who you really are. You know, I absolutely love colour, but I find it so difficult to work with at times. You know, I feel that I make a right mess of it. Um, unless, oh, excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> oh, <coughs> hopefully that's a, that's the last one. Hopefully, but I sometimes make a right pig's ear of it, especially if I've got the sandbox of digital colours to play with. Because there's just way too much choice, so I have to limit myself. And even then, I don't always make really good colour choices or colour combinations. 
but if I limit myself to monochrome or analogous, perhaps with just one little bit here and there of some complementary colour to really lift the colours, then things aren't quite as bad as I think they are. They don't turn out quite as badly as they could, perhaps. And um, but again, it's all part and it's all part and parcel of the exploration that is forever happening as an artist. Certainly, in my case, anyway. And particularly as well, as you grow as a person, as you age, things, I suppose, change as well. Your aesthetics change. You know, as I stop and think here, there's been an awful lot of times lately. That's a very strange tentacle, but it is what it is. It's doing its own thing. It's got a personality of its own and it wants to go off in a different direction to all the others. It does not want to curl around at the tip. Perfect little place for me to put some things along there. Um, so all the muted colours I've been using lately are colours that I would have shied away from just a couple of years ago. But I'm re they're really growing into me, whereas the really bright and vivid colours aren't quite so much me anymore and that's how things go I think we're continually learning and growing and then the people we share our art with perhaps can still still will still recognize what we do because we still have our stamp on it you know something about it that says oh i know who did that even if there's loads of artwork out there that's very similar you can still tell who a particular artist is okay drunken party skull time because you can never have enough of them This one's got a very wide head, perhaps because it's being squashed a little. I've got one there, but I can't work out where else to put one. I, I could squash one in here. Let's have a... They're only having four teeth today. This one's actually wedged behind the quote, which actually is a nice thing to do, I think. So I've got everything growing out from behind it, so why not a skull? In fact, I'll echo that over here and perhaps have Let's have some teeth going here, with part of a skull sticking out here as well. There we go. That's quite fun. I like that. And these tiny little spaces in between the teeth, I'm just going to fill with black because it helps them to stand out. Those little spaces always look untidy to me. Tea. So I'm now I'm getting there. So let's just darken up the lines at the bottom and to the left of the teeth and everything else here. A couple of tiny little spaces there. This poor skull is seriously squished, but it's fine. I'll just add some um, stripy bits. I'm really I am enjoying this. This is lovely and um, I'm not really thinking about what I'm doing. 
other than I didn't I didn't set out with the idea of doing anything that involved skulls or anything else. I will put some dots where there's shadow as well. So that's a bit of a surprise, but not surprising is the quote by Tim Burton. I'm not going to put any shadows on the eyeball to make. Perhaps I should, just in case. But, um, part of me is now thinking ahead and thinking, right, OK, I'd quite like to use alcohol markers for this. So if I get it drawn, I can scan it in and print it on marker paper. Job done. There we are. Sorted that one out, worked out that quandary conundrum. It was something I wanted to add a touch of ink to here somewhere and I can't see where it was now. Okay, so not a, not a single party hat in sight here. So this really does kind of speak to me or of me as an artist. It's that sense of fun and whimsy and silliness and ridiculousness as well that can appear so much in my work and that's fine and good I think. Yeah, part of me is so tempted to add colour to this now. But I'm not going to because I will want to add colour at another time. If I do that, I can't scan it in and print it out on the appropriate paper to use for the medium I'd like to use. And of course, if I leave it black and white, I can add colour digitally as well. Which will be an interesting and quite a large project by the time I've done this. It'll be a pain, pain project because all of these little lines with little gaps in. But then I'll have the opportunity to learn more about the digital art package I use. It's all learning tips and tricks and how you can make things happen for you. And I'm more than happy to do that to be honest. I learnt quite a lot about my digital art package when I was inking in these um, templates of fanciful birds. It was, um, I needed to learn how to do certain things and suddenly Penny started to click as to how these things work. I do get very overwhelmed with too much information or too much, this is how you do this, this is how you do this. And I'm a great believer in not trying to learn everything at once, but learning things on a need to learn them when it comes to things, you know. Let me get happy with what I'm doing at the moment and then I'll learn a bit more. I watched a very interesting video while I was coming around this morning. Uh, Mark Brunette, it's on YouTube. And he teaches digital art and shares some you no know, lessons and insights there. And the one I was looking at today was about how to add shadow and contrast in your art. You know, the grayscale, the shadows and so on, which is interesting. It made me think a bit about that as well. So... Something I need to work on. But I tend to be very simplistic in what I do. Um, and again, I'm not looking for realism, which is... His art is kind of, um, you know, uh, almost like computer characters or your know, computer game characters. Um, and that kind of thing. So they, they look very realistic. The lighting, 
everything is quite realistic, but in that kind of um, anime, manga you know, that kind of way. I, I don't know what you'd call it because I haven't, I just don't know. It's very lovely. It's lots of people and I'm not a people, people drawing artist. Skulls and bones, yeah, I do them. People, generally not. Um, there's somebody did ask if I could have a look at drawing whimsical people. And that turned into me drawing robots. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I had some things there to think about and consider. And no doubt that will appear in work at, at a later date as I try things out and, and you know, work things out. So I think I'm going to leave this here for today with you. It's a start. And you can tell there's going there's a lot more to do. It's just over 50 minutes, or about 50 minutes of drawing here, lots of talking. Um, not just have I given you things to look at, I've given you a lot to think about, and story time as well. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this. Lots of things are the same, and I didn't explain how to draw things, but hopefully you could see what I was doing. I wasn't focusing on that today. Um, sorry, but you know, leave a comment if that's something you want to see how I draw my, my funny skulls, uh, and so on. Um, but thank you for joining me, and look after yourselves, and above all else, take time to be creative. Bye-bye for now. Bye. Hoyle.